Time was running out for Team Starkid, and they still couldn't crack the code. Founded in a small basement theater in Ann Arbor, Michigan, the group found international fame when their low-budget parody musical, Harry Potter the Musical, unexpectedly went viral on YouTube. In the following five years, they embarked on two nationwide tours, parodied everything from Disney to Batman, and managed to pull in over $1 million in revenue in a single year. On social media, it looked like the troops struck gold, but in reality, not so much. Part of what made Star Kids so popular was how they didn't charge people to watch their musicals, hosting them entirely for free on YouTube. Because of this, the early years of Star Kid relied heavily on ongoing merchandise and album sales to bridge the gap between annual projects. But technology moves fast. The online world was a whole new frontier come 2014, and the rise of streaming made album sales irrelevant. Running out of money and carrying the weight of their fans' sky-high expectations, the future of Star Kid hinged on one of the biggest risks in the company's history. Staging two shows at the same time. One, a musical parody of Star Wars called Annie, and the other, an original show based on the Oregon Trail. No, not that Oregon Trail. This one. Children of the 70s and 80s will never forget the Oregon Trail. The game's popularity has survived the test of time. Have you played the Oregon Trail? I did play uh, the Oregon Trail game, and like many others, I think I died of dysentery. For the better part of 10 years, Starkid actor Jeff Blim hit boulder after boulder in his attempt to turn the 1970s computer game into a musical. But now, the show inched closer to its final life. It was like, uh-oh, this show's changing a lot, you know, because no, none of the other shows had really gone through that big of changes. I mean, I thought it had problems. It's like there, were, that, there was a reason I kept trying to crack the code, kept changing the script, was because I knew things didn't work. This is the story of a small theater company's huge gamble, about the intersection between making art for views and making it for love, and about one man's radical attempt to make a song about dying of dysentery. This is the story of Team Star Kids Trail to Oregon. It's been a hard trek for old twiddling thumbs McGee. When it comes to the hard nine to five life, the last thing a person wants to do when they get home is cook. Thankfully, Factor makes it a lot easier than it used to be. With Factor, you can skip the extra trips to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning too, while still getting that rootin' tootin' flavor and nutritional quality as well. This November, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-picked meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, hooey! No prep, no mess, it's so easy, anyone in the family can do it. These trails do be hard, but love keeps us together. And Factor. Isn't that right? Don't do nanny. Oh, gosh, wait. Yes. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code WITW50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Again, that's factor75.com and promo code WITW50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Damn it. Got typhoid again. You know, in a world where Spider-Man 2 and Call of Duty exist, it's easy to forget that not too long ago, computer games used to look like this. Eat your heart out, Grand Theft Auto. But don't let those clunky 8-bit blocks fool you. When the Oregon Trail game came out, it was unlike anything the world had ever seen before. Originally created by student teachers for an 8th grade history class, the game placed players in the mud-covered boots of a family traveling from Independence, Missouri to Oregon City, Oregon. Or, or Oregon? I don't know, I'm gonna say Oregon for this video. Now, let's get one thing straight right from the get-go. 
Traveling the real Oregon Trail in the 1800s was a literal f***ing nightmare. What started out as a fun cross-country adventure inevitably turned into people getting poisoned from rattlesnake bites, frostbit in the Rocky Mountains, and contracting diseases that left them dying in the worst ways possible. Absolutely horrible for those in the 1840s. But morbidly entertaining for kids in a school computer lab. It was this little, you know, you had this little covered wagon that would just scroll and go like this, and then you get some text that says, oh, your whole family died of dysentery. And you go, great, what did I learn here? I don't know. And the fun of it was like coming up with silly, goofy names for your family. Like that was the most fun. Initially a jazz trumpet major at the University of Michigan, Blim realized he didn't want to play the trumpet the rest of his life and decided to add on a second major that was sure to bring in the big bucks later on down the road. A degree in theater performance. Blim quickly ran into an all too familiar problem for students in a college acting program. He wasn't getting cast. During his junior year at the University of Michigan, Blim decided to take matters into his own hands and participated in 24-hour theater at the student-run theater company Basement Arts. The annual event was a place for groups of students to throw ideas at the wall and create a play in, you guessed it, 24 hours. When brainstorming ideas for what his group's show could be about, Blim suggested a whole show based on the Oregon Trail computer game called Oregon Trail, the movie, a play. To call the original 24-hour theater version of Oregon unhinged puts it mildly. The show followed a group of kids on the computer coming up with ridiculous names for their characters, only to actually get sucked into the game with them. These characters included Fast and Furious star Paul Walker, actress Megan Fox, and alpha male CIA agent Jack Bauer. Bauer was very much the star of the show, trying to save the day in the most ridiculous ways possible, culminating in this super macho ballad called When the World's at Stake. Uh, he, 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 <laughs> he ties a wagon to his member, <laughs> to his, because this is something Jack Bauer would do to save the day. It just, and wait, you know, let's see it. How did that? So basically the wagon breaks and the oxen run off. And Jack Bauer says, there's only one way. You need to tie this wagon to my and I will pull it all the way to Oregon. And so this was, this was the moment of the show. And it wasn't a hit. People, people, it was the perfect 24 hour theater idea because it makes no sense. But see, the fun of it is everyone is on board to go, of course. Of course, this is the thing to do. The journey of Oregon Trail, the movie, a play, very well could have ended with that basement arts performance. But then, someone made a suggestion to Jeff Blim that would go on to dominate the next 10 years of his life. They suggested he turn the play into a musical. I will take you to Mordor! Basement Arts did more than just inspire Jack Bauer to pull a wagon with his own personal ox. In 2009, another group of theater majors, led by Darren Chris, Brian Holden, and brothers Matt and Nick Lang, staged a parody musical based on Harry Potter. Wanting to share the performance with a handful of friends and family, but too lazy to burn DVDs, the group posted it to YouTube instead and exploded into a viral sensation. What could have easily been a one-off happy accident instead turned into a full-fledged production company called Team Star Kid. The troupe revolutionized musical theater, not only in its low budget creativity, but also in its accessibility by uploading every production to their YouTube channel, making it easier to gain millions of fans around the world. As one person commented on our Firebringer video, they are a boy band of musical theater tropes. Every fan will have their favorite Star Kid and be excited about who is cast in what role. Each new musical Star Kid released made the fan base grow more and more passionate, and their expectations climbed even higher. And the troupe's funding wasn't keeping pace. With little revenue pouring in from streaming and merchandise, the Langs assumed that a one-off reading of A Very Potter Senior Year would be Starkid's final show. Matt and Nick Lang decided to move on to their next chapter and started a Kickstarter for their first major production outside of the Starkid umbrella, a spoof of the Disney movie Aladdin called Twisted. The Langs hoped to raise $88,000. 
they raised 142,000. When the Langs raised nearly double their goal, they noticed a mistake on the Kickstarter page, unknowingly referring to Twisted as Starkid's new show. Starkid was once again saved by a happy accident, and Twisted was met with a ray of response. But now the Langs had a problem. The fans obviously wanted more Starkid, but the business model they had always used of setting up one musical a year for a three-day run wasn't profitable anymore. Enter the Starkid summer season. The plan was simple. The opportunity for more profit with two main musicals that would run in a repertory style, alternating nights while a slew of different late night acts would go on after each, shooting the number of performances to 79. Basically, we we're just trying to make double the content for the same initial cost. So we're trying to make more stuff for the YouTube channel. As the sole writers and directors for the company, Nick and Matt Lang decided it was finally time to venture to a galaxy far, far away with a Star Wars spoof called Annie. Now, it's a huge undertaking to write and direct just one new musical from scratch. To do it for two in a year is unthinkable. As the Langs moved forward on the summer season idea, the question still remained. What were they gonna do for the second show? After a couple years in New York, Jeff Blim's Oregon Trail musical looked immensely different at this point than any iteration that came before. Instead of kids getting sucked into the game, it now followed a group of kids sent back in time to the real Oregon Trail by the US government to stop the dysentery outbreak. The one thing that didn't change? Jack Bauer. Besides a staged reading in a smoke-filled theater in Reno, two rejections to the New York Musical Theater Festival, and months of rewriting the piece with his friends, Drew DeFore and Chris Allen, the musical had gone nowhere. I mean, to be fair, the script was out of its mind. And I had this, oh, and I had this song called We Are the Government. And it goes, we are the government. Gov 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 government. I thought it was ridiculously funny, but you know, there was it, there's no structure. It, it was not a mu you know, it was not a traditional musical, let's put it that way. He wrote, he rewrote, he composed, he recomposed. He even made the tough decision to get rid of the Jack Bauer character. And still, Blim couldn't crack the code. As the years rolled on, he eventually set the project aside to turn his attention towards Starkid. Over the next two years, the actor's over-the-top energy led to him becoming a fan favorite, racking up show-stealing roles in Holy Musical Batman, A Very Potter Senior Year, and Twisted. But the Oregon Trail show never left his mind. One night, Blim found himself at a house party talking with Nick and Matt Lang. The brothers were all in on the summer season idea and decided to place their biggest bet yet. They wanted to stage the trail to Oregon. With the entire future of Starkid hanging in the balance, this wasn't just a gamble on a new show. It wasn't just a gamble on the future of the company. This was a gamble on Jeff Blim. So when it comes to casting, Star Kid doesn't go for the traditional open audition, where any actor can try out for a show with two monologues and a song. Going all the way back to their first production at Basement Arts, casting's always been within their circle. Casting for the summer season was no different. They tend to already have casting in mind. I think like the, the auditions are more to just be like, are we right about this instinct? I'm Jamie Lynn Beatty, and I played the daughter in Star Kids Crown of Oregon. The way they had kind of set it up was like set up a pool of people that they knew were going to be in like either one of the two shows, either Annie or Oregon, and then had kind of just done a series of like uh, not auditions necessarily, but just like everyone reading different parts. Well, I'll finish chewing this piece of a fake bar. Well, Hi everyone, I'm Joey Richter. If you're using any of this and being like, who is this guy talking? The Langs didn't want Annie to be a by-the-numbers parody musical, however. 
In the spirit of experimentation, they decided that none of the actors would sing. Instead, a band would play and sing all the songs over the action, like the musical montages in the Rocky films. They knew that there wasn't gonna be any singing in that show, and so I think they knew that they wanted those of us to be in Oregon because like they wanted that to be an actual musical where we were where we were singing. It was still up in the air at this time about who would actually write the music for the trail to Oregon. Even though Blim previously composed songs for the show, he assumed they'd be scrapped in favor of the band also writing the songs for Annie. But then, Nick Lang asked to hear some of Blim's songs. Blim shared two of the earliest songs he'd written for the show. One, called The Prettiest, originally meant to be sung by the character Megan Fox, and the other, called Pays to be an Animal, meant to be sung by a kid who becomes half ox after getting sucked into the game. Lang listened to these songs, and he was sold. Just two months before opening night, casting for the summer season was finalized in May of 2014. Tickets went on sale shortly after. The fans were ecstatic over the news of a Star Kid Star Wars parody, and many were intrigued by the idea of a musical based on the Oregon Trail game. The thing they were most excited for, though, was that they were getting two Star Kid shows at the same time. Rehearsals were set to begin a couple weeks after the announcement, and things seemed to be falling into place. There was just one tiny little hiccup. The team hadn't even come close to cracking the Trail to Oregon script. Their current version was an Avatar Freaky Friday approach, with a kid being beamed into the body of a 40-year-old man trying to learn how to be a good father. It wasn't working. Two weeks out from rehearsal starting, the creative team sat on a couch in the living room of the Lang's house, frustrated. Through each rewrite of the script, the team kept running into the same problem. They could never figure out what this musical was supposed to be about. The problem with the script always was it was a hat on a hat, where you, when we weren't just trying to do a period piece about the Oregon Trail. We were trying to capture the nostalgia factor, so make it, you know, include the game element. And so it was always like, is this a, is this a modern day musical about a computer game? Or is this an old timey musical about the Oregon Trail? And so that's why the code was never cracked. That's when a light bulb went off for Matt Lang. Part of what made the original Oregon Trail game so much fun was how much freedom it gave to the players. Thieves stealing your oxen, your wagon catching fire, and your grandpa dying of dysentery were just a few of the obstacles faced throughout the game, all based on real diary entries from Oregon Trail pioneers. How each player reacted to these challenges made no two games alike. This gave Matt Lang an idea. What if the show was the game and the actual audience were the players? Blim said it himself. The fun of it was like coming up with silly, goofy names for your family. Instead of having the cast come up with the names in the story, the audience would do it. Overnight, the show changed from a sci-fi musical a la Avatar into a road trip comedy musical more in the vein of National Lampoon's Vacation. The improv aspect drastically changed the creative team's approach to the show, writing in as many moments for audience interaction as they could on a script writing speed run. There was a whole series of different things in the show where like when the family was forging the river at the end before they crashed, they got tested on trivia from the trail to Oregon. Let me like read a, a section of this. Uh oh gang, look at that. There's a huge boulder straight ahead. We need to avoid it, but I feel like I can only do that if somebody, anybody, shouts out the correct answers to some Oregon Trail trivia questions. There's a whole quiz section, which is funny, and then I don't I think they fail and then they crash. I remember being like, we should have something where like you like throw like the audience throws like foam rocks or something. Like I wanted there to be more audience interaction where like almost like Rocky Horror Picture Show where like the audience was like actually participating in the disasters that were happening. And they were like, uh-huh, no. The new version of the script made its debut that summer at a reading for both Annie and Oregon. It's hard to tell what kind of show you've written until you've actually heard it in action. And if the first reading for Trail to Oregon was any indication, it wasn't a good one. 
we had the read through in the living room of Matt and Nick's place. And we read through both shows. And the initial reaction was like, oh no, Oregon's going to be a stanker. <laughs> like, the cards were stacked against Oregon right from the get go. Not only was the script not completely finished, it also had the smallest cast in Starkid history. The average cast size up to this point was 18. Oregon had six. Of course, that still didn't stop Joey Richter from playing eight different characters. What's more, Oregon was unlike any other Star Kid show up to this point, opting for an improv focus instead of a scripted parody. What wasn't alive in that reading was the improvisational element that brings that show to life. The, the play with the audience, the play among the cast members where things are changing in real time. After that first read through was when Nick and Matt like kind of finally first heard the pacing of everything. And then that's when, when like big cuts were made. Recognizing the need to get to the ending sooner, the Langs and Blim decided to cut the trivia section. And a super niche scene with Robert J. Walker? You know, Secretary of Treasury to President James K. Polk. While any rehearsals rolled along smoothly, the cast involved with Trail were hit with new changes every day. Making things even more difficult was dealing with the characters' names changing every show. We would just, to practice for the rehearsals, use template names. One of the characters' names was like, yeah, that's good chicken, or like something that was like more than just like fork or like apple. Like it had like vocal color and like a way you were supposed to deliver it. And there's something fun about that. And yet the question still remained. Would anyone really care about an original musical based on an obscure computer game? Given Starkid's history with pure parodies and how poorly Oregon performed in read-throughs, Many knew how this season was going to end. Annie was going to be the big hit of the summer. When the fans finally took their seats on July 3rd, 2014, none of them really knew what they were getting into. I remember the beginning of the, sh of the show when we first started to ask people for names. It's like people didn't know that was part of it. So it's like, I think there was a little more hesitance and there was a little more like, Oh, uh, okay, I'll throw out a name. The names for the first few performances were pretty tame, with the father being named Zachary and the mother Dorothy. The greatest gag wasn't working, but that all changed in the show's second week when the fans started to come back. Now knowing what to expect, the names became much more colorful, with some of the standouts including Guy Fieri, John Stamos's thong, girl, please help me, please help me, and sir, it's a lot, just to name a few. When it came time to film the production for Star Kids YouTube channel, the team debated backstage about if they should plant audience members to make sure they got some really good suggestions. Blim said no plants. Let's just see what the hell happens. All right, pioneers, what do you say? What would you like to name me, your wagon leader? What did you say? Oh, Jack Bauer. Someone randomly pitched it, and that's why I'm, I look so surprised and excited on the YouTube version, because I didn't expect it. Uh, it was a woman, and she was in the right side of the crowd, and she shouted, and I think afterwards I talked to her, and she said, uh, like she knew that I had a thing for Jack Bauer and that's why she said it, but it wasn't planned. Over 10 years after Blim tried everything to make Jack Bauer a character in the show, the macho CIA agent fittingly found his way back to the Oregon Trail. Of all the morbidly entertaining things to happen in the Oregon Trail computer game, dying of dysentery was probably the most iconic. So of course, it was gonna make it in the show. When audience members entered stage 773 in Chicago, they were each handed a ticket and told to put it in the jar of who they wanted to see die that night. Father, mother, daughter, son, or grandpa. After learning who would die that night backstage at intermission, the unlucky victim would blow the audience away with a musical theater coup de gras called You Gotta Go.
Yeah, I remember writing that in my apartment. Yeah, and that was just, we wanted a song that everybody could sing, and uh, <laughs> fart their brains out, or poop their brains out. It was just Joey making the noises. Well, it was just discovering different parts of my arm that could make different noises. So, you know, it's like you have, like, harder, like... Uh, like drier stuff but then you have like these this inner part in your arm where it's like thicker and it's like and that creates like a wetter thicker fart so it was basically just like you know it was like a symphony you're just like you're just feeling it out in those moments to see where it where it works best in a google hangout for the summer season nick lang expressed how they didn't have enough money to afford a film crew to be there each night meaning whatever death happened the night of filming would be whatever one made the YouTube version. Then they had another idea. They'd film all in one night. Then at the end of the video, the viewer could click on who they wanted to see die and be redirected to that video to watch the finale. That felt the most like having a live studio audience, which I actually wish we would do more. We told the audience, you'll see the show the way it's supposed to be, but then we're going to reset to the beginning of the scene where Joey announces who's dying, and then you're gonna see the f next per the father die, and then you're gonna see the daughter die, and then you're gonna see the son die. So it was a moment for everyone in the cast to kind of shine and have their big finale in that death scene. And so it was it was really it was really lovely. The Star Kids summer season ended in August of 2014 and the troupe uploaded Annie, a parody, to YouTube three months later. Initially, Nick Lang sent out this tweet, saying, I think it's one of Star Kid's best shows. I hope you like it too. Though most of the comments were supportive, the ones that weren't were pretty ruthless, with many voicing displeasure over the actors not singing and struggling to understand the Star Wars references. With the Star Kid fan base strongly divided, and many disappointed by the new direction the group was taking, the impending release of the Trail to Oregon and the future of Team Star Kid looked bleak. Annie should have been a hit. It boasted a big cast, stayed true to the Star Kid's techno rock sound, and was based on a mainstream title. Instead, it became one of Star Kid's lowest viewed videos to date getting 1.3 million views in nine years. In January 2015, Nick Lang tweeted, just looked at the Annie YouTube comments. Wow, you kids are brutal. Like, my heart is breaking. Wow. And followed it up with a Facebook post declaring he wanted to punch his own eyes until they fell out of his head. Trail to Oregon, however, became a bona fide hit. And as of November 2023, it has 4.5 million views. YouTube is a tricky game. Just when you think you figured out what your audience wants, something changes. What makes Trail to Oregon so significant in the journey of Starkid is in its fearless experimentation. Sure, it's kind of based on a computer game, but looking at its DNA, Oregon is the first Star Kids show that's 95% original. It's so easy to get stuck in a pattern with video creation. To constantly try replicating what's worked in the past in hopes it'll still work in the future. The bigger a channel gets, the scarier it becomes to experiment. It's much easier to trick yourself into thinking viewers expect the same old, same old. Trail to Oregon proved this isn't always the case. The show did so well that a producer offered to take the show to New York, and to date, it's the only Star Kid show that's ever run off Broadway. The success of Oregon gave Star Kid the confidence it needed to embrace the original, and the failure of Annie convinced Nick Lang that the parody musical trend was running out of steam. Star Kid has not made a pure parody since. It was cool to finally end that chapter of the Chasing the Oregon Trail musical, because that was defined my 20s for whatever reason. The, again, the experience of performing and getting in positive feedback is different than writing and getting positive feedback. So 
I mean, it was selfishly awesome to run around as a candy man in, in, mus in Holy Musical Batman. And whereas Trail to Oregon, I think it was much more, it was fun to be a part of this thing that you helped create. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it's cool. And yet one of the biggest things to come out of the Star Kid summer season was how the Lang's bet on Jeff Blim paid off and eventually led to him taking on a bigger composing role within the troupe. But absolutely none of this would have happened if they didn't take that first chance on him by casting him as the dastardly villain Sweet Tooth in Holy Musical Batman. Click on this video to learn more about the history of the Batman musical we didn't deserve and support us on Patreon to get your name on this wall of fame and get exclusive behind the scenes content on the makings of all our videos.